year and I'm particularly delighted to introduce this one because it's a really exciting project um, that we have here, which is uh, the publication of the fifth um, volume based on select proceedings of the University of Chester Archaeology Student Conferences, which have run for five years and each year there's been a publication that's come out of it, which is drawn on um, expertise of experts, but also of our students as well. And our undergraduates and postgraduates have been involved in um, editing and contributing. So, and the conferences themselves have also been an absolute delight uh, to watch. I've been fortunate enough to be at each of them over the past few years. So first of all, I'm going to pass over to one of the editors, Howard. Um, to introduce the book, could I just remind people, if, if possible, to um, turn off your microphones and less speaking, uh, because we are recording this and hoping to put it up on our YouTube channel. Um, we will turn the uh, recording off before the Q&A session um, so we can have free flowing discussion there. But for now, if I could pass over to Howard to introduce uh, the public archaeology of treasure. Hello, everybody. And uh, yeah, thanks very much, Cara. That's fantastic. And welcome, everybody. And uh, we've got lots of individual speakers uh, in the schedule. That'd be me, my co-editors and then our guest presenters. And we wanted this event to be a celebration of the book, but also to point the way to some of the themes we didn't cover in the book. And like any edited collection, there's yawning gaps as well as lots of individual treasures in the contributions of, in of the individual papers. But I want to sort of start off by saying this book came together as one of a series of student conferences that were simultaneously intended as pedagogic exercises for the students in their final year, um, a course called Archaeology and Contemporary Society, where they learn about the many different facets of public archaeology, the politics of archaeology, archaeology in our contemporary world, um, but also um, as a um, public event, um, many of them at the Grosvenor um, a museum's lecture theatre, although the final one, the sixth conference in 2021, happened all online, and um, also to serve as uh, addressing a research theme, which you some of the we selected themes um, that uh, the students really were struggling to find collated information on, even though there was individual articles out there and there's a lot of discussion in the archaeological community about these themes. We tried each time to pick a conference that tackled a theme that would push into new research territory with guest speakers, with discussants, as well as the students themselves presenting. And from that, we decided for five of the conferences, the first five and the six, as I said, we just went online and the online record is, I think, a, a, a result in itself. For the first five, we tried to take it forward to publication with student editors and student contributors. So we in 2019, we had the archaeology, the public archaeology of death published with Equinox in Sheffield. And then uh, we had the first of the Archaeopress volumes also in 2019, the public, um, um, what's it called? Public Archaeology Arts of Engagement, which was um, both books were edited by myself with uh, students and uh, my colleague Caroline, Caroline Pudney on the second volume. So those both came out in 2019. And of course, because the Archaeopress have this access to archaeology series the um arts of engagement but was the first one that was downloadable for free and then we decided that was a good route to go down so with the third conference digging into the dark ages um uh, pauline clark uh, now a doctoral researcher at, at the university of chester and myself edited this collection from the third conference all about early medieval public archaeologies and again downloadable and then also that was in 2020 and this is also 2020 the public archaeology of frontiers and borderland edited um, again with pauline clark but also with um former student kieran gleave who's now pursuing a phd at cambridge and so that book is again open access and downloadable and the fifth volume was i suppose really in an ideal world would have come out in 2021 but there was this thing called the pandemic and uh, we finally got it out and it came out in august and while still paper book paperback copies are still winging their way through the the the, the real postage system towards various uh, people who purchased them or uh, have acquired them um you can download this one for free and this is the one we're talking about today the the fifth volume from the 2020 student conference the public archaeology of treasure edited by myself peter evil 
and Sammy Clegg, who, both of whom are with us today. So before I hand on to, over to them, I just want to make a final point about, obviously, we're very grateful um, to um, the publishers, Equinox and Archaea Press. We're very grateful to all the contributors, all the peer reviewers and all those that are supported to the events on the day, all the students who got involved and um, the publications. I've just counted it up because I never had before. But, um, this got 59 students' names into print as authors in different capacities and six student editors. And I think that that is, must be rare or um, distinctive as a set of um, volumes that have, I think, some research merit. They, they contribute to the field of research, but have their origins as a pedagogic exercise and a public engagement activity. So I think uh, there's a lot to celebrate with all the volumes. And I, I think this is both a, um, because of the COVID pandemic, we did, couldn't do any launches for the last three, last three. So this is serving to celebrate also, particularly these last two 2020 volumes, which couldn't have a book launch. <laughs> and also in a, in a sad moment in a way for me, because this is the last one I'm going to be taking forward to publication. But I want to thank everyone that's been involved at every level, from the students to the contributors, to the peer reviewers, to the, the people that have retweeted everything. They're, they're, let's, thank, let's thank the Twitterati too. And uh, I'll hand over to my colleagues who co-edited with me, Peter and Sammy. Peter, do you want to say anything? And I'll, I'll shut off my mic so that you can take over. I haven't really got a huge amount to say because I think as, as a, a volume, it, it speaks for itself. And um, I'm really quite proud about the contribution that's been made um, and the wide reaching nature of the volume itself. The 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 conference itself was was a brilliant day or two days because there was a Twitter conference afterwards and that reached a certain level of audience. Um, but then this this process seems to give give an afterlife to what were were two fantastic days of contributions and editing these together into sort of one single volume is is really quite powerful and and as how it's already said this isn't really covered anywhere else you can read about treasure in the portable antiquities scheme annual reports you can read about it in the treasure trove reports from scotland but actually physically addressing the questions and some of the questions about not just the process, but um, sort of the impact that has on museums is really important. Um, there are a couple of, of articles which I thought were particularly good, as in one one is that the um, the, the, the one by Gail is is really insightful into the process of, of treasure in England and Wales and actually what happens to the to the sort of the wider situation and from an academic point of view, I really enjoyed Kenny's paper um, at the end, Kenny Brophy's on, on um, the green bling, um, because that summarises many of the things that I think um, we tend to forget when we're looking at the shiny gold, um, is that, that everything is, is important and the green stuff is just as important as the shiny stuff. For me, though, this book also brings together a uh, part of my life, my chapter, <laughs> as it were, um, is bookended because I left the Portable Antiquity Scheme earlier this year after 18 years long service to the cause. So from that point of view, um, this actually marks really quite a, a nice sort of pivot in, in my career to say, here we are, this is where we've got to. And hopefully um, people like Andy, who's going to speak later, is, is going to carry the baton forward into whatever happens next with the, the Treasure Act and the Treasure Review. Um, that's probably enough for me to, at the moment, but um, should I pass over to, to Sammy? Th thanks, Peter. Yeah, Sammy, tell us what you think. You're the student editor. <laughs> I, I think um, a lot of the themes have been have been addressed and, you know, the amount of pride that I have for this volume is um, tremendous and that goes to everybody who's contributed so thank you very much for that. Um, just to kind of maybe summarise the book a little bit, it's more of kind of a voyage into the adjective description of treasure as well in the sense of how the terms apply to archaeological objects and how these are treated and how they're mistreated as well which I think is a massive part and the perceptions of these objects as treasure and treasure as a label. Um, so the insight it offers is really valuable to anybody coming into it and um, for me I feel like I learned a lot in the process and I think um, just to reiterate what Peter said about Gail's chapter and his own chapter, I think are both fantastic at explaining the actual process of treasure or objects going from, say, from the ground to actually being these declared items. So uh, thank you both. I thought they were really excellent. Um, going forwards now, I think there's a lot of relevance in it and how we look at the situation in Ukraine. So the loss of threat 
from cultural treasures, I think not just in the material sense, I think it's really valuable. So I think there are still discussions that we can have about that. Um, more localised as well, when we see um, objects now being declared as treasure. So we had the um, the bronze pendant that I think, did that go on display in the, the Stonehenge? Uh, thumbs up, thank you. And um, even more localised for me on the Isle of Man was a, a Whitby Jet necklace from the Bronze Age that has gone on display in our museum, and that's now treasure, so woohoo. Um, so yeah, it's really valuable, I'm incredibly proud, and I think a lot of it goes down to the students as well who contributed on the day. Fortunately, I couldn't be there, um, but they're all online on Vimeo, so I would recommend anybody who is interested in the book for watching. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. I'll hand over back to you. And I'll hand over back to Cara, but thanks everybody, and that's really uh, set us up for our guest presentations. Yeah, so thank you, Howard, Peter and Sammy, um, the editors of the volume that we are celebrating today. Uh, but we're now going to hand over to um, a couple of speakers to talk on this theme, um, which will make up the rest of our seminar today. And so I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Ben Geary, who I believe is talking on behalf of himself and Rosie Everett. Um, ben from University College Cork and Rosie from Northumbria University and going to be talking about brown gold. So if I could hand over to you, Ben. Um, thank you very much. This is, is the usual teams. Can everyone hear me? That's a good start. OK, so the next next part of it, of course, is um, can everyone see me? So just bear with me while I make this bit work. And that's that. Can everyone see that? Yes, you're great. Thanks, Ben. Excellent. That's that's a good start. OK, so um, so thank you, um, everyone, everyone for attending and thank you for, for the invitation. Um, that's a remarkable series of, of books there. And it, it's so good to see um, student involvement in, in these things. I think it's brilliant. I'm sorry to hear it's the last one, actually, because I was going to hassle Howard to do something maybe on a similar theme about some of the stuff I'm going to talk about now. Um, so yeah, so the, the, this talk is is brown gold, or it may have the title, What's the Point of Pointy Sticks and Peat? Um, there is some brown gold before you there. Um, this paper is 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 kind of, um, I mean, I'm giving it, but it's work that's really come out of working with Rosie, who's just mentioned, and there's kind of voices from a few other colleagues I've, I've worked with over the years who whose identity might kind of pop up as we go along. Um, I'm not going to speak too long. I'm just going to check the time there. Maybe about 15 minutes. Um, um, I hope that's that's OK. Um, I should probably explain first off, you know, how how this invitation came about. And it was from from a Twitter conversation a few years ago when when how put a shout out on Twitter about the volume and kind of asked for thoughts and, for, and other themes. And, and, and this is what I kind of suggested at the time was, you know, how about valuing wetness organic material, particularly from peatlands, from bogs. I'm going to show you some pictures of that in a minute. You know, how do we define or recognise a, a piece of prehistoric work wood as an artefact with value? How do we define that or its treasure? Um, and particularly, you know, what do we keep and what do we conserve and what do we just discard? And to be honest, I kind of said this in my usual kind of slightly grumpy old man way that I do these days. And, and didn't think much more of it um, until Howard got back in touch. So it kind of worked quite well because because we it's, it relates to some work that I myself, myself, myself and Rosie have been doing over the last few years, looking at these kind of different articulations of value around peatlands in particular. So that's kind of kind of the background. Um, just a very brief bit bit of an introduction. Um, so peat, what what is peat? I'm, I'm sure sure most of you know. Um, vegetation that hasn't decayed that accumulates in in wet places um very important in a number of ways not just the preservation of archaeology the big theme at the moment as some of you may know is that is the preservation and conservation of bogs as net carbon sinks as well and there's a really interesting intersection of that with with heritage and archaeology which is another talk um completely so i'm talking about the preservation of, of, of organic material probably the most iconic of, of those finds would of course be bog bodies which you mentioned peatland archaeology and we say oh bog bodies yeah they're great but they're extremely rare finds they tend, tend to dominate the conversation and they dominate museums but with obviously very good reason 
um, but they're by no means the commonest um, of discoveries in, in bogs um, across Europe, or at least in those bogs across Europe that have been disturbed sufficiently to expose the archaeology, which is, of course is another one of the problems. Um, I, sorry, I always have to show this picture. This is um, a colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Tom Hill, um, who was at the Natural History Museum, is now now freelance environmental archaeologist. Um, it always makes me laugh. Um, as you can see, I laughed a lot there. I've been laughing ever since. Um, I suppose uh, partly I just like to show the picture, I send him a message and so I've shown the picture again and, you know, that will upset him. Um, in fact, if you want to tweet it to him on on, um, on Twitter, then do, do feel free. I should have said that earlier. Anyone wants to tweet anything, then please, please tweet away. Um, the point really of the picture is obviously we tend to think of, you know, preservation of, of material in wetlands is because they're wet, a bit like this. But actually the problem we have with archaeology is, is, is the bogs that are drying out or are being drained. Um, drainage tends to be anthropogenic, um, but climate change in particular is presenting a number of threats to bogs, to carbon and also the, the archaeology that is within bogs as well. And, um, you know, this is back in nine, back in 2001, I think it, it was, Richard Brunning said there's a crisis facing the preservation of archaeology and bogs in Europe. And that certainly was true and it has got worse. So again, I suppose if that articulates or speaks back to this idea of value and valuation and um, what we regard as valuable, how we protect it, preserve it and conserve it. And again, these are all very pressing problems, as you all know. Um, so this is, a, this is a lovely picture. It's a photo it's a photograph by Mike Bamforth, who maybe well be familiar to, to some of you. Um, it's a fantastic um, Peeland archaeologist. Um, this is a photograph of a lovely pencil point from a worked oak timber from the site of, of Beckles, which is in the Waveney Valley in Suffolk, a site we, we worked on some years ago. Um, and it can, you can see the preservation of this sort of material. You can see the tool marks there, wonderful axe, iron axe tool marks on that wood. Um, I say dendro date from the timber 75 BC. Um, and the problem with all this kind of material is it looks fresh and well preserved when you dig it up, but it can dry it extremely quickly and degrade. And this, in fact, is a is an oak timber from the same site. This is how the site was discovered during bank realignment work. A post was pulled out. Uh, the digger driver thought it was just a modern fence post, kind of chucked it to one side. The archaeologist on the watching brief came along later and went, uh oh. But you can kind of see this material dries out extremely quickly once it's out of the preservation environment, which which provides a number of problems for us in terms of how we deal with this material as it comes out of the ground. Do we conserve it or do we record it and chuck it? And again, you know, what's what's you know, what do we have the resources to do? That's the perennial problem for us in archaeology, of course. And again, if we look more broadly, you know, this this problem of deterioration of organic organic material in peatlands and wetlands, uh, the research on those accelerated, you know, hugely over the last, I suppose, last 10, 15 years or so. And um, of course, the work at Star Car that our colleagues at Chester have been um, heavily involved in, and the problems with the deterioration of the Mesolithic organic archaeology there, the very famously named, you know, jelly bones, picture of that there from the from the GIS paper. Um, the acidification of the ground environment is just destroying the archaeology. It's literally falling apart in the ground. So again, how do how do we deal with these sites? We have to try and preserve them by record. You know, that costs money. Who's going to pay for it? Oh, sorry. So yeah, without a doubt, Starcar no longer possesses the riches it did only 60 years ago, is a quote from that paper. We see something similar, but not quite as drastic. Um, this is, of course, the, the site of Must Farm, as I'm sure most of you recognise, remarkable, a remarkable archaeological site. Um, a huge amount of argument and discussion over whether it needed to be excavated or not. Um, a lot of that discussion turned around the issues to do with the groundwater, or where the groundwater was positioned, whether the material or the site could be preserved in situ. Um, that argument went on for some time, and in the end, it was decided that, that the conditions are not suitable for preservation in situ, and hence, hence the requirement for excavation. I mean, again, like an incredible site, but uh, you know, I draw your attention to the massive wooden room material that's recovered from these sites that's exposed. And again, you know, what do we do with it? And not just that, how, we do, how do we justify our decisions, I suppose? What do we choose to keep? Um, and what do we say about it to the public as well? And, um, and this, is, this is something that will come back to in a minute. Um, so, so again, more remarkable stuff from from uh, from Must Farm from the Must Farm Paleo channels. This is one of the 
one of the um, incredible Bronze Age lock boats under excavation. That's an absolutely wonderful photograph. And again, the Cambridge unit were having to develop new methods and approaches to, to excavate a three dimensional log boat in situ, with this, including, including those borks that are left in there to support the boat as it's being excavated. And again, obviously, these are these are remarkably important finds. Um, you know, again, some treasure, however we define it. Um, so, you know, what do you do with that stuff? Um, and of course, the decision making taken in that case was to uh, was to conserve it. So the boats were lifted and taken away to Flag Fen, which more in a, in a sec, just down the road. Um, and those boats, you can go and actually look through the little window there and see them being conserved in PEG, which is the wax that you need to soak these uh, organic materials in, wood, wood in particular, in order to stabilise them, conserve them for later museum um, decay. I love these boats, by the way, they've all got these fantastic, fantastic names. I'm sure there's a story behind that. This, I think, is, yes, there you go. This is Jolly, Jolly Binos. Who knows? Um, but again, you know, this all costs money and a facility to to put the material into. Um, so, yeah, things that are felt worthy of preservation and um, display for the public in the future. Um, if we look a bit more broadly, um, it's all well and good talking about conservation of organic archaeological remains, uh, but a problem that's always struck me beyond uh, beyond the cost and time that it takes is sometimes, I must admit, the, the end product um, through no fault of the conservators, indeed, it's, I think it's just the nature of the material. So this is a shot of uh, the Clownstown Mesolithic fish baskets from, from an, um, an Irish site um, just outside um, Dublin on the um, discovers part of the N3 motorway scheme. And again, incredible, incredible complex of burnt mounds constructed next to uh, an infilled lake. There's peat deposits. Um, and this is one of these, these fantastic woven fish baskets that was discovered during excavation, block lifted, extremely fragile for later conservation, along with some other organic uh, wooden finds that came from this extremely important site. Um, here is the fish basket on display in the National Museum in Dublin. I don't know if some of you may well have seen it. Uh, it's actually really easy to miss it. You go into the main entrance into the big hall in the centre of the museum. You turn left and it's this material is in a case on the right. Um, Pre-lockdown pre and, and, and the event that we sh which we try to forget about, um, I'd take students to the museum on my wetlands course and I'd often kind of just release them to the museum and say, go and find some organic archaeology. And it'd be remarkable how often people would just walk past this case because it's, uh, you know, it's kind of, again, it's not for the museum as such, but you kind of look at this in a box and it just looks like small wooden sticks in a block of peat, which actually, you know, it is. So it's difficult to display. It's expensive to conserve. And, you know, it's, it's quite, you know, I think it's difficult. That's a, it's a problem for the public, I suppose, in terms of communicating not only that rarity and the value, but, but you know, these are the problems of display and conservation. This is another shot of the same object in, and some other items from from the Clownstown site just on the right there you can see that kind of strange little white pointy thing that's an older wood vessel or maybe a, a, it's been suggested as perhaps a, a child's toy or a, a ritual god help us boat um, carving of some form but you know again the point here is no matter how we interpret these things that it just looks like old wood in a box and you know it kind of is the title of the toy of the talk pointy sticks and pete that's actually one of mike banther's line you know he just says you know we just we're digging up pointy sticks um in a very you know typically self-deprecating way um but you know there is this bigger issue of, of you know of value not not least in situations where we are seeing active deterioration for whatever reason um this is is flag fen again that's the preservation ball so it's not a great picture of the section of the Bronze Age alignment, the timber alignment, where you can go and see the wood in situ. And again, you can probably just, some of you I'm sure have been there. Um, even that material, even though it's kept wet at the moment, the spring system is, is, is deteriorating and that's producing problems in terms of the display in the future of that material. You know, what, you know, what do we do about that? Um, and again, there's other issues with flag fen. There's, a, there's this picture on the right with a, of a piece of wood with a ra very obvious radial splitting. That's a very typical sign of, of wood that is deteriorating due to the position of the water table. 
So, you know, Flagfen itself, um, I don't think any secret to say this, you know, it has, has some problems. And I think at some point in the future, there's going to have to be a discussion about, you know, how that is handled uh, in terms of whether it can be preserved in situ, whether we need to excavate it. If we excavate it, you know, what do we keep? Um, what do we put in a display case? What do we preserve by record? So, uh, you know, there's all these problems. Again, I'm sorry, this talk's probably getting really quite, really quite miserable. Um, <laughs> On that note, um, we talk about the public. This is the, the gift shop at Flag Femme. Now, some years ago, some of you may be old enough to remember this. Um, if you ever went um, to visit the, the, Fl the Flag Femme Visitor Centre, you used to be able to buy in little plastic boxes um, bits of wood from Flag Femme. It had a little label on it saying archaeological wood, you know, 3,000 years old from Flag Femme. Um, a few years ago, I was chatting, I think it was to Mike or someone else at, at, at Flag Femme, and they'd stopped selling them. And I said, why? Do you? I thought that was quite cool. And they'd had complaints from the public who'd said, well, you know, why are you selling off bits of bits of archaeology? Um, and obviously, it was, that was a difficult conversation to have. And much less the fact that th we have loads of wood and we can't keep and conserve it all. And um, someone else said to me, well, you didn't really want to say to tell them that the, the rest of the wood be, would be mulched and put on Francis Prize blackberries. So, so you know, I, 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 it's an anecdote that, but I think it is another issue about communication to the public of the value of, of wood and also times when we just can't keep everything and we need to um, need to decide what to do with it but again you can no longer I couldn't even find a photograph I hope to find one on the internet and I couldn't you can't even find a photograph of the little plastic boxes you used to be able to buy so um kind of this has been a bit of a whistle stop tour I'm coming coming kind of to the end here I hope it's giving you all some food for thought um within the broader context of value and valuation and treasure or however we define that i've not seen the book i look forward to looking at it so at the, the moment you're in the position where we, we do have to discard wood i'm sorry howard i think this is the only bit of medieval archaeology in the whole talk um this is some archaeology archaeological wooden points from another wetland site in ireland side of the sheen some excavations oh, some time ago now but again I, I was visiting the site for some work purposes and and of course what's happening is material is being discarded it's being recorded and discarded because what else can we do with it uh, at the end of the day there's, a, there's, there's quite a lot of it and it can't all be kept you can see how long ago it is that's a nokia an old nokia phone blimey i miss those things um okay so yeah to kind of close things out a little bit um this again i'm sure is familiar to, to most of you this is the um this is the structure buller um that's a remarkable piece of treasure you know how will we we define define that but again to bring ourselves back to the title of the talk you know this this piece of bronze age bling or whatever um is is this value of it have we we think about that and we could argue about that for a while you know it's depleted by the fact we we don't understand the context it came from um the peat so you know the brown gold in this case is is you know it's essential we we have that and understand that context and um we've been involved in a small piece of work trying to trying to establish that and to work with the metal detector and um, other people some of whom are present in the talk today to um to try and understand that to, to situate the, the the gold within the context of the brown gold without without that you know as, as you all know as archaeologists without that context um you know its value is is reduced okay so just to kind of tie this up and put this in a bigger picture um we, we have this crisis in terms of the preservation of organic archaeology uh, across Europe. This is something that's come out of the work at Star Car, the work on Somerset Levels, Richard Brunning's work, and a variety of other projects that have been published or underway at the moment. Um, so the work of Adam Boethius, some of you may be familiar with, and this was published, I think, last year, was it? Quite recently. Um, the site of Agaroth, or Agarodid, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, the famous Scandinavian site, and, and again, the archaeological material there is deteriorating in the ground due to problems with, with the groundwater so the particular bone there is, is just going it's disappearing um and this is a quote from that paper you know says, we need a plan of how to stop or deal with the ongoing accelerated deterioration on a broad international scale and we need to consider if we can and should excavate these threatened sites now while they still have organic preservation so you know this is a challenge for all of us moving forward and, and we have to see that challenge within the context of as i've said several times you, 
value that means value for the public as well as archaeological value however defined um, we also have to situate it in the context as i said earlier of, of peel and restoration and rehabilitation and the money that is going into that at the moment not much of that money for that re non is going into understanding the impacts of or the state of archaeology that survives in many peelands or indeed the impact of restoration programs on what remains and without that kind of work then then predictions of the complete destruction or loss of most peeland archaeology over the next 10 years i think will probably come true and if that's not cheery for a wednesday afternoon i don't know what is so listen i'm going to i'm going to stop there um i'm going to just leave you with a bit of plug because books are being plugged um i have a book being published this month uh with my colleague henry chapman which is about peeland archaeology and pair environments and again it has some small discussion including rosie's section on a few of the things um that i've talked about today and also some great pieces from from other um well and deep peelandy people so if that's your kind of bag or if that's the kind of thing you might be interested in them then please have a look on that that's going to go it's going to be an oxbow publication so um i'm going to stop at that point I hope that's been of some interest and I hope it's given everyone a bit of um, food for thought. But thanks again for inviting me and well done everyone who's been involved in these publications and to Howard for pulling this together through time. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Uh, very thought provoking. Um, if at times bleak towards the end um, paper, but um, if everyone could get tweeting that, that picture, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> Just an extra plug for that. Um, but no, thank you very much, Ben. Um, we're now going to turn to um, Andy Agate um, from the Portable Antiquity Scheme, um, who is going to be talking to us about a, with a paper entitled TV or not TV? The question of digging for treasure tonight. So Andy, if I could pass over to you. Thank you very much. Um, Unfortunately, I, well, not unfortunately, I, I, didn't, I haven't really prepared a, a PowerPoint thing because there's really not very many pictures to uh, to show. So I'm just going to um, chat on for, for 15 minutes or so and uh, ruminate on my appearance in the first episode of Digging for Treasure Tonight, um, which was a bit of an event in uh, sort of TV archaeology. Is it archaeology? Is it not archaeology? Metal detecting? Yeah, it is, I suppose. Um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, about being asked on the programme about the front lash, as I'm calling it, um, the, the comments that came up before the programme was even aired uh, about how we made the show, but make a little bit about making the show, uh, my experiences there, um, the backlash and about the consequences where I'm going to be a bit depressing as well. And I have got three, four little slides that I'm going to try and share with you there. Um, so first of all, thanks for inviting me on to talk about this. Um, the, the book's usually um, enjoyable, informative, uh, and I, I would like to thank Peter uh, Reeve as well for asking me to offer some comments on his paper. So I was aware of some of the content of, of this. Um, I About the TV programme, I enjoyed participating in this just on a, on a professional and personal level. It was it was great. I had a great time. The people I met were great. The detectorists were engaging. Um, as, as quite often they are. Um, I think they can, metal detectors can get a bad press, but you know, they're just people like you and I, they're, they're, they're great. Um, the production staff were friendly and interesting and interested. Um, ben Walker, Michaela Strachan, Raksha Dave, they were absolutely lovely. I had a complete blast. I really enjoyed making the programme and I was really pleased to be on it and to represent um, the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Um, so, about being asked uh, on the program, um, I it was a sort of mid July um, time this year when um, I was been looking through the email trail and it, it seems that not all the presenters were in place. Daisy Beck, the, who were the production company, were thinking about making this program, digging for treasure. Um, they'd only just met the club um, that were involved on site, so it, this this program was put together, I think, fairly quickly and I was talking to somebody today and they agreed with that somebody from the production company um, and early in the first week of August I got uh, uh, an email from Daisy Beck and to asking if I would be interested in um, my name had come up somehow and uh, uh, asking if I'd be interested um, and um, 
I I said to this, uh, I, my reply to this email was, I'm I'm not certain why my this is I'm reading from the email. I'm not I'm not certain why my name's been suggested for this, as I'm the FO for for Northumberland. The, the program was to be shot in uh, near North Allerton in in Yorkshire. I don't have a connection to Yorkshire or the detectorist there. And I, I went on to say at the end of that fairly short email, um, as others have noted, it's a poor choice of title. Linking, linking metal detecting to digging for treasure is exactly what my job is not about. Um, so I wasn't terribly keen uh, at first. So anyway, uh, by the 5th of August, I was fully signed up after being schmoozed a little bit by the uh, by the TV company. And really, I'm joking about you know, being schmoozed. I was, I was very reassured. Um, about their approach to it. They seemed very serious uh, and, and really wanted to take on board the serious messages of, of responsible detecting. They were really interested about the treasure process. They were really interested in in the portable antiquity scheme, which it would seem, uh, and and I sort of can confirm from other emails, that they really only found about after the, found out about after the programme had been commissioned. And they had really only engaged with the PAS once the programme had been commissioned. Um, so, there was this real focus right from the beginning on on best practice. Um, so I said I was signed up. I spoke to a friend of I spoke to a friend of mine uh, who's a lecturer at Newcastle University and uh, and said I'm involved with this television program. It's called Digging for Treasure Tonight. And, and he looked at me very sagely and said, Ah, career ending then. Um, so you know, I already knew that that that, that this was going to have some. You know, it's going to cause a stir in in some ways, and it it did seem to have what I called a front lash. So, um, you know, get a backlash against something. But there was some pushback before the program even aired. Um, so let's talk about the the that that sort of front lash. And I've taken some emails uh, or some posts rather from metal detectorists from uh, a couple of metal detecting forums and Facebook groups on the on the internet, and. Um, Metal detectors really do have a, a really, when we're talking about treasure, they really have a um, a very real engagement with the public archaeology of treasure uh, in a in a real sense. They do find treasure, and they have a, 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 an interest in the in the legal process of treasure. So, you know, they've got an idea about treasure, um, but there was quite a lot of pushback, especially about the title. So th th this is a few quotes. So um, one is the, the most irritating part of these is the celeb. This is, you have to really remember this is this is from uh, the 16th of August. So this is the day after I made the programme and a week or so, 10 days before it actually aired. The most irritating part of these is the celebrity who has made no effort to research even the most basic facets of the subject and asking the most stupid questions. So obviously seeing something else somewhere. Um, Another saying, this is the last thing we need. Yet another programme where there's a subtle narrative that experts are all great and good and detectorists are bad, i.e. amateurish, uneducated, excited by the mundane and obsessed with the making of golden finds. Um, this kind of treasure hunting, in inverted commas, coverage on the mainstream TV, in my opinion, can only serve to bring negativity to our great hobby. And it's really interesting that that, that pushback against the, the the treasure hunting um title there which um the the the, the main magazine that um metal detectorists subscribe to is is a magazine called treasure hunting um so it's not as if that's a surprise to them um so another another is saying the likes of this portrayal can only introduce the wrong people into the hobby and surely that's not a good thing um one to leave well alone not get involved with it would not be detector friendly and designed to make participant, to participants look like children in need of guidance. And this sort of this sort of goes on and on. So there is there is sort of a degree of paranoia, um, I suppose, in metal detecting. Um, it's um, it's a hobby that sees itself very much under threat. Um, and it's really interesting that, that that there was that pushback just from the title. This is before the before the um, the trailer had even gone out, so nobody really knew anything about the program. Um, so it was really only by about the nineteenth of August I start seeing on the forums um, comments saying well, people are saying, "Oh, why don't we watch it and see and see what it's like?" And that you know that sort of gained some traction. So. Um, so we get on to, to to making the show about about making the show, uh, which was 
Look, I've never been involved in any uh, television work to do with to do with archaeology or really about anything else. But um, I had a lot of conversations beforehand. It took up a great deal of my time, um, sort of the, the whole week, ten days before the program, late night conversations with the producers and and what have you, and their expectations, and indeed my expectations, the things that I would and wouldn't do. Um, and I got down to the to the site in North Allerton, uh, about an hour's drive away from uh, where I live in Newcastle upon Tyne. I uh, got there about one o'clock in the afternoon uh, and on arrival I was um, and I was with Kevin Leahy by the way as well so I wasn't on my own I did have some support so Kevin Leahy from the British Museum um, uh, and I was given a box of, of finds so the, the, the program had been on uh, sorry the, the detectors had been on site since the Sunday so the, the day before I was there on the 15th of August which is the Monday uh, and they'd been detecting during the Sunday and Monday morning I was given a box of about 40, 50 fines from memory, and with the instruction, if you could just um, if you could just have a look through these, please. If you could just uh, put them into order for me, date order, get some chronology going, and then uh, tell us exactly what they are, um, the period that they came from, all that sort of thing. And, um, and then if you can find 20 of them that are really good that we might um, put on the television, and then uh, five that are, that are really super um, that we'll definitely talk about. I said, okay, right, well, how long have I got to do that then? And they said, oh, about an hour and a half. Um, which I tried to explain was it was probably about a day's work, um, really. And uh, you know, they 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 were really surprised about the the, the how they hadn't, hadn't planned for for sort of the knowledge that you that you need. And and as an as a finance liaison officer, you are sort of expected to know um, everything from about forty thousand years ago, every object from about forty thousand years ago to to things that were made yesterday and everything in between. So. Um, you don't necessarily know all those things. Obviously, you you know where to look. You know where to get the knowledge from, as as you do with with lots of archaeology. So, with the help of a little WhatsApp group I'd set up, and, and with um, Kevin Lee here especially, we we managed to sort of get through the the finds and and put them into very very quickly, really rough and ready, and put them into some sort of order, so we could um, we could start the start the rehearsals. Um, which went on till about four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, and we had some some lunch after that. While I was still looking through the finds that had come up during the afternoon, while we'd been doing these rehearsals, um, and by about half past six, we were going to start shooting the program itself, which was going to last until about half past eight. Um, and I was absolutely uh, exhausted. So. This is where it, it becomes, I'm going to mention this, it's, it's, it's not academically relevant in the slightest, but when you see people on television, you don't know their backstories and things that they've been through. And, and I tried to be quite upbeat and, and um, you know, um, all that kind of thing on, on, on television, sort of, you know, to, to make myself look um, like I was engaged and enthusiastic about everything. And I think that, that came across. But I had actually had a liver transplant 13 months beforehand. And... I was only just getting to a point where I could work full, you know, full days and full weeks, you know, full weeks of, of work. Um, a lot of fatigue involved in in um, the operation, you know, the, the the afterwards of the operation, and um, so I was I was exhausted, and it, and it was a real personal achievement to be able to get through that long day. It ended up being about a fifteen hour day. Um, we didn't finish till about eleven o'clock. I didn't come till after midnight. Um, and it was it was it was a, just a fantastic personal achievement to get through being able to think on your feet, um, you know, being able to to answer the questions quickly and and, and concisely that they were that they were asking. Um, and it's important to 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 note that during the the the, the making of the program, I was able to put in quite a lot of my own content, my own ideas, and what the PAS especially the messages that the PAS wanted to talk about. So I was just having a conversation um, with Dan Walker and he said, oh, well, how much is that worth then, Andy? And, and I said, well, we, we never talk about monetary value. And he said, he was shocked. He said, really, you, you never talk. And he said, we've got to get that into the programme. And it, for me, it was sort of a personal highlight. I was able to talk about how we don't, we don't ascribe monetary value to, to to treasure items, to any items. And Alison Sheridan, I think it's a key quick a key quote from the, in the second program in the series. She says the treasure is the knowledge, and I think that is really important. And it's important that we try and you know make that connection and get that point across. So we've made the program. Great personal achievement. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so we get onto the to the backlash, which. After after the front lash, um, I suppose was it was like being licked by kittens, really. 
Uh, and it's quite important to say that that, um, that it's quite. Uh, I think it's quite fortuitous that Channel Five isn't available in Poland. Um, if if you, if you know about that, you know about it. So um, I won't explain that further. But there were a lot on the forums again. There were a lot of quite positive comments um, from from metal detectorists. Um, somebody saying it had all the right components, good finds, good prevent, good presenters. It's my favourite bit. A very competent FLO, a representative bunch of detectorists, but somehow didn't come together properly for me. And I think that's really, um, I think that's really important. That didn't come together properly for me. Uh, somebody said, uh, another person on the forum said, um, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the phrase, all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. And I, I think that that really, uh, once I watched the programme, I was, I, I was on holiday when it was broadcast, so I didn't see it for a couple of weeks. But when I came out and watched it, I think it was exactly right. I thought the programme was a, a little bit of a mess, actually. It didn't have a narrative. Um, and that's really important for that show, having or that type of show, having a narrative. Um, we were promised that at the beginning. Dan Walker said we are going to talk about the people who lived, fought and died uh, on this in this area. And, and then they, they just didn't talk about that at all. It wasn't they, they they managed to edit out everything that I was saying about the people who were using objects. So they, they, it was very object focused. And as the series went on, particularly Helen Geek was was really good at um, putting the people into it. And and she we did talk about it afterwards. And, and Helen said oh, after watching your um, your episode, that, you know, I was absolutely determined we were going to get people into it. And I think that's really important, you know, um, in, in TV treasure programmes, if we're going to um, go forward with them, it's to be able to talk about um, talk about people. Um, uh, other people were saying it was not time team. But of course, it's not time team. Yes, you're exactly right. Well done. Um, but we're digging in the title. I think that's, that's sort of there's a misrepresentation there. Um, but and this is something that, that um, Howard and Bethany brought up in their um, YouTube conversation. Metal detectorists do call their rallies when they get large groups of people. They call them digs. You know, any digs going on this afternoon. And as an archaeologist, I do find that quite, uh, quite frustrating. Um, so there were lots of lots of you know I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the program you know, things like oh there was no junk shown well you know that's like saying well can we see the machining on an archaeology archaeology program can we see the machining and the and the shovel work and the mattocking whilst people are digging you don't want that you want to see the, the actual discoveries that are of, of interest and that actually tell you something um so there was another uh, comment saying that apparently the Portland antiquity scheme were not originally involved in the show but were asked to be there so this was from um uh, a comment on um a facebook group that, that pipeline news um on twitter picked up on and and gave the, the pas some stick that we weren't involved prior to commissioning that we weren't able to um have any input into the format design which i thought was a really unfair comment because you can't really have any input into something you don't know anything about um, we didn't know that the programme was going to happen, so how could the Portland Antiquity Scheme become involved in it? But it is important to say that we did have input uh, into into the into the programme, the content of the programme as it was going along. It's really it's really apparent that you know from from all the comments that that, that you that you get from these programmes that, it, that the programme wasn't made um, for detectorists you know it was it was irritating for detectorists it wasn't made for archaeologists you know it was quite irritating for archaeologists i think the people i know who were, were french family or, or just sort of casual observers that have, have mentioned it people with acquaintances that i've met they, they quite enjoyed it if they watched it they, they they really did you know they thought it was they thought it was fun and thinking about the series um in the round um it was interesting to it was interesting to watch Howard and Bethany with their YouTube um, conversation. If people have seen that, um, which was sort of a conversation of two halves. I had um, you like this, Howard. I had a, an email, uh, so I sent the link. I, I watched it and I sent the link up to Michael Lewis, who's the head of the Portland Antiquities Scheme, and um, he sent me an email back saying, "I've watched half of this. Let's talk. We we might need to talk about this." And I said, "It's okay, Michael. Watch the other half. Uh, watch it to the end. It's fine." Because at the end of that, it, it's at the end of that, um, um, Bethany and Howard are saying that oh, we, you know, I'd do this if I was asked. Yeah, it was, it was great at the end. You know, the last two were brilliant. They were really good. Not, I don't know if the word brilliant was used, but but the, the last two programs I found hugely enjoyable. And that's because they had a narrative. They started thinking about stories more and they listened to some of the things that we'd been saying. 
Um, I think those two programmes were also filmed in daylight, which was much more amenable to, to the archaeology and, and telling stories. It doesn't need to be done at night. Um, a really interesting point that Howard made was about the follow up. Um, you know, how, how can we access the finds? How can we look at the finds afterwards? What are the stories afterwards? And I'm going to mention Time Team again. This is very much like the first couple of series of Time Team, where I think there were no post excavation reports. Um, which they got heavily criticised for and then started producing really quite good excavation reports. I can't, and the poor, people from the Portable Antiquity Scheme can't force anybody to record anything. And um, as far as I know, none, none of those finds have yet been um, reported to me. That's not surprising because they're made in, in, in North Yorkshire. I don't know if they've any have been reported to finance liaison offices in, in Yorkshire or from anywhere else across the country that people came from because people had travelled a long, some people had travelled a long way. And they would travelled a long way because that the group was organised, it was a, a, actually a limited company called North Detecting Events who organised the people there to do the detecting. And these rallies and this talk of treasure in, in public archaeology and, the, and bringing people together to find treasure, however we want to describe it, um, is having an impact on, on uh, the way metal detecting is done. And these sort of TV treasure programmes and uh, metal detecting programmes, which there's been a couple of now, um, are likely to have some, some consequences. And um, this is the point at which I'm going to try and um, share my screen. So let's try this. Let's see if let's see if I can do any of this. Um, OK, what do I want to share with you? Let's try this. OK, can anybody can somebody tell me if they can see a, a PowerPoint? Yes, um, can you can see a PowerPoint. Oh, that's absolutely we can brilliant. See a it's only four sides of this. OK, so what might what might the rise and rise of TV treasure bring? So um, we had the Harry Cole treasure metal detecting treasure program as well, which I haven't seen, but uh, it's been reported to me wasn't very good. Um, there's there's undoubtedly a rising. This is a very simplistic model, so forgive me. There's there's a rise in the popularity of, of metal detecting um, and that that increasing popularity um, brings with it an increasing demand for land so that people can detect and that land is increasingly supplied supplied by companies like uh, North Metal uh, North Detecting Events, who, who are a commercial metal detecting rally group. So they they're sort of basically buying up land so they can pay because they they charge 25, 30 quid for people to detect for a day or a weekend. Um, they they're buying up land. They can buy the farmers off. They can give them hundreds of pounds or a few hundred pounds for a day's detecting. Which you, you, you're one or two people, you're, you're a couple of friends, like on the program detectorists, aren't able to do. A bottle of scotch at Christmas was what the farmer would get previously. Because there's more people digging, more treasuries found. More, uh, the more treasures found, more TV interest in, in that audience is, 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 is gathered. More public awareness of treasure because it gets reported on the television. There's a rise in popularity. So this is going round and round the fines that we have. And how do we break that cycle? Well, as far as I can see, and I'm afraid this is depressing again, like the, the end of the last um, presentation, um, downbeat anyway. Um, there's only two ways really I can see that the, 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 the cycle is broken, where the land runs out or the fines run out. And the finite nature of archeology span is something that metal detectorists and metal detecting organizations, you know, organizations that represent metal detectorists need to start thinking about um, sooner rather than later, something archaeology went through a long, a long time ago. Um, and we need to, to get people thinking that things like this is treasure rather than um, uh, this, uh, rather than the shiny things. And this is something that I um, was, was excavating last week in, in, um, in Northumberland, a, a nice in situ row of loom weights. Um, but that's rather um, missing the point of what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to stop presenting that. Uh, am I back? I don't know. Am I back or not? I can't. I can't yeah, tell. Yeah, you're back. I'm back. Oh, good, 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 good. Um, um, so that's it, really. And I, I, I kind of want to finish with with that quote again from from um, from Alison Sheridan that the, the, the treasure um, is the knowledge. It's not the shiny thing. And 
really, how do we convince the public that the public archaeology of treasure is, is not the valuable objects, but the knowledge that we gain through them? Uh, so that's me. Thank you very much for um, for listening. And thank you for another really insightful talk there, Andy. So thank you very much. Um, 